um, I will uh, try to guide you through uh, the story of uh, Russian media and Russian press. We don't have much time, so I will just basically start. Um, but um, there are two things that I want to say in advance. Uh, the first is that the fight isn't over. The crackdown continues. The repression continues. Just last week, uh, one of the leading independent uh, Russian media outlets, Medusa, was labeled as undesired organization, which is already in exile for many years, I, I have to say, uh, operating from, from Latvia main, mainly. And uh, I will get to that later, what it, what it means, but it uh, means that the hunt for Russian media continues even now, uh, almost a year uh, after, the war, after the war started. And the second thing is that uh, the that media, uh, press, journalism, journalists, uh, they do not um, exist in vacuum. The freedom of press is deeply intertwined with freedom itself. It uh, reflects the uh, stage of, uh, of democracy, the stage of uh, the level of all other freedoms that uh, uh, the nation enjoys. So the story of Russian press is the story of the freedom in Russia and the story of, of its failed democracy, we can, uh, we can say. Um, the nation is as free as is free its press. That's how it is. Um, so, and, uh, and this is the journey of uh, how uh, an aspiring new state, an aspiring new society, an aspiring new press started its journey and ended uh, where it is now. So it started um, 35 years ago, uh, even in Soviet times, when uh, with so-called perestroika, uh, Perestroika um, was when Gorbachev came to, came to power. He uh, intended to liberate um, Soviet society, Soviet nation, uh, the big Soviet, so Soviet nation. And uh, basically, Perestroika started with two things. End of uh, um, 1986, um, when Andrei Sakharov, who knows the name? Okay, you know. Andrei Sakharov, um, Nobel laureate and uh, academician and uh, dissident, uh, the most famous Russian dissident, was freed from exile in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, where he spent a few years before. When he, so he got back to Moscow, and that was the first sign that uh, things start changing. And the second thing was, uh, uh, it was uh, the film, the movie, the release of... Uh, uh, film a movie from Georgia about Stalin, which uh, came to theaters in, I think it was February 1987, uh, after, uh, after being uh, spe spend, uh, spending a few years on shelves, um, banned from, from release, as many others, um, many books, uh, uh, movies, films, whatever it was, because, because uh, Soviet life was heavily censored. And that's when the liberation started, basically. So perestroika and glasnost was about freedom of speech. That's what it means in, in, in Russian. It was basically about free press and free access to, to information. And, that's, and it was mainly about, when it started, about destalinization, about the nation learning uh, about the horrors of Stalin's terror, which was kept in secret for uh, decades before, before that. That's when uh, Solzhenitsyn's Archipelago Gulag, Archipelago Gulag was uh, published in 1989. And, uh, and the, this new life, new, the entrance of, uh, uh, of free speech and access to, to history, to information, newspapers abandoned, started being, uh, publishing whatever they wanted, uh, and uh, it became new era of um, of, of freedom, basically. It uh, even during late so Soviet times under under, under Gorbachev. Mm. So Perestroika liberated the national mind in 1991. As you probably probably know, the hardlines uh, communists uh, staged a coup, 
which failed. It was August 1999, and that's, and that's when the Soviet system collapsed entirely, uh, stopped to exist. And um, Russia em emerged as a new state with uh, Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, as its president at the, at the helm. Firstly, first time in history, Russians elected its president uh, in an election. And uh, the era of freedom starts. And that is very important and amazing time in Russian history when Russia was never in its history as free as it was from late, uh, very late 80s, let's say 1990 until, uh, until 1993, to be, to, to, be, to be correct. That it was the freest um, nation, the freest society, the freest country. The freedom was, the, it was freedom of everything, freedom of uh, conscience, religion, travel, um, sex, whatever, you, na you, you name it. And of course, freedom of, freedom of press political freedom, freedom of vote. The problem was that freedom, this freedom, these freedoms were not uh, institu institutionalized. They were not implemented in a working democratic mechanism. On the contrary, the years of uh, uh, Yeltsin, they were marked by his uh, struggle by the struggle between two branches of, uh, of power, let's say, executive branch, the president and the parliament, which ended, as you probably know, and probably, oh, maybe you, di you didn't, in 1993 with uh, um, tanks firing the building, at the building of, uh, of, Russian, of, Russian, of Russian parliament. This is one lake which, uh, which, which, uh, um, which uh, in 1991, when when the hardlines uh, staged the coup, they uh, released uh, Swan Lake on every television channel, and it became the symbol of the returning sense of Soviet Soviet censorship. But that was not for, that was not for long. So, Russian media were as free as 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 they were before, uh, and um, Russia was a free free state and free and free country. Let's. Uh, and, uh, but let's see what happened next. I can talk hours about it, but I will try to be quick. The problem is that, uh, that failing democracy, th there is not a single sort of point in time when you can point at and see that that's when everything went wrong. You can't do that. It's just the history is not black and white. Uh, yes, of course, the, um, when Putin came to, um, to, uh, to scene, when he became president, there was no way back. That, that, was, that, that was all. That was finished, basically. We just li started leaving the consequences. But still, there is, no, um, there is no single turning point. That's important to know. But the first major turning point in what led Russia to uh, what it become was the uh, was the presidential election of 1996 when uh, Boris Yeltsin um, wanted to get re-elected and his rival was Gennady Zyuganov here he here he is um, the leader of Communist Party and the problem was that uh, Boris Yeltsin was highly unpopular he was like, his approval rating was three five percent. When, he, when the, the presidential campaign started. And it was basically he was set to lose this, this election. And it was clear that he was going to lose it. And, but the problem is that the stakes, democracy should operate as um, uh, unpainfully. If uh, power changes, it's not, it shouldn't be a big problem. Well, opposition comes to power, then they change again, and nobody really suffers. It just, we just go on. The problem with Russian democracy, um, Russian undeveloped democracy, was that the stakes from the very start were extremely high. What happens if opposition takes the power? That was the major question in 1996. What will happen if communists come, come back to power? The platform of Gennady Zyuganov was the restoration of socialism. What does it mean in practice? Nobody knew, but it was very uh, scary. I remember myself how I cared about Yeltsin winning this election because I was afraid that communism will get back. And uh, 
three years before when when when, Yel when Yeltsin's tanks were sh shooting, it was not just out of nowhere because the uh, the hardline hardliners in the parliament they uh, threatened when they amassed the power, they threatened to to arrest and 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 possibly execute the leaders of democratic revolution. That was also true, and that was three years before. So what happens during this election if Zyuganov wins? That was the question that nobody wanted to really to answer. And this is when, first time in Russian history, the state enters the process, the political process. Um, this, the, the idea is that during this election that you can probably mobilize the nation to make it make the right choice. Democracy should win, not communism, not getting back but democracy. But you have to make people understand it and mobilize it around this idea. And this is when uh, the media also started playing this game, I, I, I would say. Um, the media become the main tool of this campaign. The, private independent television channel NTV, which just started um, being very popular during uh, the war in Chechnya, Yeltsin's war in Chechnya, which started one, one two, year, two years before, highly, heavily criticizing the government Yel and, and Yeltsin for the war in Chechnya, stops doing it. Uh, because everyone now has a, has, a, has a goal, a mission to get uh, Yeltsin re-elected and to make people understand how important it is to Yeltsin to get back. And um, every, uh, at that time, every well-known journalist becomes a propagandist. That's how it was, because that's how they openly, sincerely, yes, we care so much about what's going on, but on the other side, also paid very well. Uh, for what for what they did, because it was president presidential campaign campaign, and that was the first time when uh, when um, people in journalism realized they can become rich in doing what in doing what they do. The uh, the smell of money entered media in 1990, 1996. So and Yeltsin and, Yel and Yeltsin won, but again that it was not what. Uh, um, what would what was the right answer? What what uh, what was the right thing to do? Who would who would know? What what would happen if Zyuganov uh, would win? Well, now we know, but back then, it uh, when you when you are in the situation, it looks very differently, right? It's very easy to judge when from from where we are now, but back then it was much harder, of course. Um, so that's when that's when main television channels be understand their power understand that they can really um, have an impact, that they, have, uh, um, that they can change political life, that they, they can elect presidents, they can do um, big, big things. The end of the 90s is, is marked by, uh, by media wars between oligarchs, uh, which owned, controlled major, major television channels. So, but, so by when Putin came to, to the scene, the... Uh, the media were already um, corrupt in, let's say, uh, within themselves and in, from, 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 from public perspective, because that everybody understood that the, uh, they um, pursue their own goals with uh, crushing uh, officials publicly, uh, discrediting their op political opponents. That's what, uh, that's what med media was in the end of 90s. And that's when Putin enters the scene. Just think about it. In July 1999, just before Putin is president, is, is nominated for, for, for presidency, becomes prime, prime, prime minister, three out of four Russians don't even know his name. He's just nobody. Just a clerk. Yes, he's the head of uh, FSB, main, uh, main Russian um, a special special force, the successor of K, of KGB, but he's in an unknown phase. Nobody knows him. Few months later, he uh, he is propelled to national popularity and to the hates of Russian power. An unknown person, and just a, an official 
uh, never taking part in an election, never in his life, in few months becomes the leader of Russia. How? Two drivers behind it. One was the war, the second war in Chechnya, which, uh, which he started in 1999. And the, and the second uh, driver is media, television. Putin was made president by television. That was time when, um, when nine o'clock news turned into, into propaganda on a scale nobody ever saw, saw before. It was not even news. It was not even, even, even um, political um, story of any kind. It was uh, lying, mocking, um, show intending to, uh, to, to corrupt uh, minds of, uh, of the viewers, to discredit the other side, because it was a very competitive election. And it did the job, and Putin become, beca uh, became the president. So, and it's also, and it's very important to understand because, because um, Putin understands it when he, when he becomes president. He knows how he became president. He knows who did him, uh, who made him president. Um, by his own experience, he knows what power media yields. And uh, so he, the first point in his agenda when he comes to power is to take control over media. And the first thing what happens, literally the next day, well, not day, but next month, he becomes, becomes president, the head of independent Russian television channel, which supported his opponents during, during, during the election. Vladimir Gusinsky, here he is, um, gets arrested. And uh, in, in one year, the private television channel and TV, one of two main, the sort of, yes, sort of internally corrupt during the 1996 election, but still an independent uh, media television channel, one of the few main, uh, two, three main television channels comes under the, uh, under the, um, um, the ownership of uh, Gazprom, Russian, um, Russian state gas, uh, gas corporation. The second oligarch who controls the other, the, the other television channel also has to flee, uh, to flee Russia. They both, have, they both flee Russia uh, basically next few months when, when Putin comes to, comes to power. And the nation sort of understands it because Putin says, well, you saw what was happening a few, few years before. They, uh, they own, they can do whatever they want. No, we have to, uh, we have to, to get it to some kind of order. We can't let them decide what, how, how we live. And basically you could feel sympathetic to that because everybody saw what was happening during the second, nine, in the second half of the 90s after the, after the election of 1996. But Putin, um, uh, Putin introduces new rules, new rules of the game. The new rules of the game are, you can't argue with Putin, never. Um, what, he says, what he says is the only truth out there. He introduces new formats of his own appearance to, to the press, so-called, if you pro pro probably saw it al already, press conferences, which are not press conferences because all, it's all staged. You can't answer, a ask a question that you want to really ask. And what's more important, you can't even argue. Yes, you can't, you, there is nothing you can do. You just basically keep speaking, that's it. And that's it. Um, Freedoms are still allowed in the early, at the early stage. Um, you can't criticize the system. You can't basically uh, criticize Putin personally that, that it's not a good thing. But the system, yes, basically it's still, it's still, it's still possible. Um, it's what's called back then managed democracy. The idea was that, and also at the same time, economic reforms were really pushed through. And uh, the idea was that at some point la later, Yes, the state would release uh, the, the institutions and uh, democracy will start working. It never did. Um, by 2004, Putin controls 
every major political institution, which was very competitive uh, during Yeltsin's time, Yeltsin times. But now, but in a few, few years later, he controls everything. He controls governors, he controls parliament, uh, he controls big business, he controls the elite, and he controls the press, the major, uh, the major um, media outlets out there. What is also very important is that uh, Russians, during uh, the start of Putin's rule, uh, when, he's, when he starts his, um, his, his rule in the, uh, the first eight years, um, from 2000 to 2008, they um, basically, um, the Russian nation starts a new life. And that's important also, also, to, also to understand. The first years of Putin's rule are the era of Russia's unseen prosperity. The, um, the average oil price soared from, from 14 to 100 in just a few years, but steadily, year after year, year, after year. the GDP uh, um, jumped 10 times in a in, 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 in few years. Every um, average Russian lived better and better with every year for, many, for, a, few, for a few years by 10% every year. That's fantastic. That's basically, you just can't imagine it, uh, how it is. You basically uh, enter a new kind of, new level of, of comfort completely. Russia's middle class, 20, 25% of the, of the population, um, starts enjoying absolutely new, um, new, new life which was, which was uh, unaccessible uh, before. Whatever it is, gyms, cars, food, restaurants, um, travel, it's, it starts being part of just average normal life for very many, very many Russians. Um, never seen before. Uh, that's, that's, that sort of uh, rising prosperity also absolutely unprecedented for, uh, for Russia. And um, that's when Russians lost their interest in politics. Um, they uh, watched this growth of censorship basically very passively because there was so much around there to enjoy and to, 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 to be happy, to, to, to feel as, as, as normal civilized people, so nice. Um, the polls uh, started to show the change of attitude towards what uh, the press is about what media uh, are about, what television is about. It's not about, it's not to inform anymore, it's to entertain. The major mission of television according to what nation thinks in the, in the media, mid-2000s mid, mid, uh, is to entertain people to And uh, major television channels, they become this kind of sophisticated, expensive, entertainment machines in which this sense as this propaganda is uh, installed uh, within in in in, in uh, as as news and television shows but the major the major idea is we entertain you what happens is um, is 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 is, the, is that when power is unchecked when there is no opposition when no, nobody can say that no this is not true that the real thing is this and and nation can really observe it then what happens the power starts to, to believe its own lies why putin has to have all the power why did he arrest in 2003 mikhail khodorkovsky the 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 richest man in in russia by by, by that by that time why in 2004 uh, when uh, Ukraine didn't vote for the president, that the candidate uh, for president that Putin was uh, standing for, but chose an another one, um, why did it all happen? The, the the Kremlin, the Putin starts presenting answers to all the, all the, all these questions, but they are different from from reality. What happened in Ukraine in 2004? It was a color revolution staged by enemies of Russia. What else could it be from from point of, point, point of Kremlin? Not just the expression of free will of Ukrainian people, according to what to what Putin, Putin thinks, and this is how this propaganda bubble starts uh, expanding into some kind of real universe uh, in which um, in which those who have power 
Putin and his uh, his circle start basically to live and start believing in what they want others to 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 to, to believe. Um, everything everything has. Uh, can be explained, but not everything. The truth is unachievable. That's one of the also the major tools of that Russia Russian propaganda uh, propaganda explores. Uh, when Alexandra Litvinenko was uh, um, poisoned with polonium in London in two thousand in two thousand six, propaganda suggests different things. What could it be? It could be Berezovsky could kill him or, or something or, or MI6 probably did it or whatever. Just so many versions of what could happen that the real one is bur bu buried, buried uh, behind the enormous amount of uh, uh, possible alternatives of what, could, uh, of, what could, of what could happen. What happened to MH17 flight in, two th in 2015? Uh, we all know, in 2014, I'm sorry, um, but uh, from even, even now it continues basically, but uh, uh, starting from, from, from when, it, when it happened, uh, the Ministry of Inter uh, Foreign Affairs, television, it could be a Ukrainian fighter jet, they could piled, uh, piled uh, the, uh, the plane with dead, dead bodies from the very, very start. So many possible uh, possible explanations of how uh, how it what it, it was done. What happened to um, to Alexei Navalny in 2000, uh, 2020 when he was poisoned uh, with Novichok? Myriads of uh, of possible poss possible. He could he could basically um, had have a bad breakfast uh, that, that that day, or anything else could happen. And uh, and that's one of the major tools of uh, of uh, how um, how the Kremlin explains uh, reality and presents it to uh, to the nation. Since then, it started back then. Also important to understand. Um, so mirror effect of propaganda is that that uh, the those who do it start to believe their their own lives. Uh, the television had headquarters uh, in in Moscow. They become sort of a a temple of this new uh, religion, uh, um, I, I, we, can, we can say. And with uh, every new year, increasingly, Putin operates within this fictional universe that he starts to, to construct and build, and which leads him uh, to, to the war, uh, finally, which uh, if you, you know uh, how he explains why he started this war and what how it connects to reality we, we live in. Also, but back then in, two, in, in late 2000s, what is important is that, uh, that some freedom are allowed. Uh, what matters is outreach. If the, the major outlets, basically television, but not only television, major newspapers, major um, radio, are under direct control. They operate as, as basically as propaganda tools, but, uh, but others can enjoy some, uh, some, some, some freedoms and uh, do their professional job. It's also still possible b uh, back, back then. In Soviet times, uh, um, censorship was a governmental institution. It, has it had its staff, apparatus, rules, how it operated. Basically, everything was clear and understood. In Russia, uh, censorship under Putin started coming in uh, with phone calls, hints, nods. Um, and uh, rely, started relying on self-censorship. Censorship, when basically the uh, the medium, the those who um, the, the journalists, um, those who talk to to the nation, they understand the rules of the game themselves. The self-censorship becomes a commanding com commanding spirit. Um, but of course, there are basically uh, new rules. They are clear for for everyone. The sensitive areas from the very start are, of course, Chechnya, which became the deadly territory, deadly territory for journalists um, from 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 the very start. And Anna Politkovskaya was uh, murdered in two thousand six. Six uh, next, uh, and you know that you 
better stay stay away from 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 Chechnya. You'd better not go because you can basically end up dead. Um, the next area of risk is Putin's private life. In 2007, the newspaper, 2008 maybe, I'm, I'm, I, but doesn't matter. Uh, the new, new newspaper, just, established, just newly established newspaper, Moscow Correspondent, published, publishes a story, runs a story about uh, Putin's uh, affair and the possible marriage, alleged affair and possible marriage to Alina Kabaeva. What, um, uh, Russian sports, 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 sports woman. In few days, it stops to exist. The, the newspaper. Um, in two thousand seven, uh, a magazine New Times uh, publish runs a story on uh, parliamentary election, on the financial part of the uh, um, of uh, parliamentary election back then. How Kremlin uh, Kremlin operates financially and. Uh, um, finances parties to to participate in the election, basically controls their funds. Uh, the author of this of this of this story, uh, she uh, she's from Moldova, and she she was national from uh, Moldovan national, Moldovan nas national Natalia Marad. She was not let to, uh, enter enter Russia a few days after, and had to stay in Mal in Moldova. And everything is supposed to teach a lesson. Uh, the, the, the industry observes and understands where you better go, where, where you better do not go, what you do not, do not explore. And it works. In 2016, uh, you know Panama Papers, which uh, revealed that uh, Putin's inner, inner circle had uh, their financial, fi financial matters and it was all, all revealed, these, le these huge leaks. Uh, mm, not any big newspaper, Russia basically did a real story about it. There was one, um, RBK newspaper with a real investigative team back then in 2016. Um, and uh, not, while not every, every major newspaper didn't dare to look at it, they did and they really explored it. So what, what happened? The top editors were fired ne ne next month, and in a few months, the, the newspaper changed its ownership. That's, that's what happened. Um, yet, by that time, in the, end of, uh, in the end of 2000s, still, there was room for, for free and professional um, journalism in, in Russia. Echo Moskvy, started, which started in 1991, uh, during the coup, ba basically, was giving um, giving its uh, floor to opposition leaders, uh, real opposition. I, I I I mean to independent political experts, journalists, and etc. Uh, Vedomosti started with Financial Times, which uh, Sasha Gubsky represents here, basically, and uh, which that was started by Dirk Sauer, right? Right. Uh, into in two thousand uh, with Financial Times and Wall Street Journal uh, introduced new. I would say standards of uh, professional um, financial financial journalism, and was true to the cause to the very end. Um, Nova Gazeta, also from from the 90s, kept explo uh, kept uh, exposing uh, Chechnya and what was going on in Chechnya during 2000s, and until until very very late. TV Rain started in 2010, which I am part am part of. Mm, and also um, and uh, came to life, uh, we, we can say, during the protests, uh, r street rallies, uh, so-called Balotnaya movement in, in 2011 when Putin announced that he is coming back to, to the Kremlin. What, what happens next? You probably heard that uh, Russia had another president for some time. <laughs> Were you I know we almost forgot it, uh, everyone. But it, but it's true. It happened. And uh, Dmitry Medvedev was Russia's president for for for, for years, from 2008 till till 2012. During these times, it there was hope that Russia would still be part, uh, despite of what was going on. There was hope that Russia would still keep, would still has this path. 
to be part of civilized world. Well, not, not a democracy, okay, but part of civilized world still. The power changes. One, well, okay, he is nominated as successor, but, he, but Putin, if Putin is not coming back, Russia maybe has has uh, has future, and uh, the rules of this uh, of the of the games were still very very tight. But uh, the but there were these islands of freedom of of press under Medvedev, and uh, it um, we thought that we had hopes uh, back then. Um, it all ends with Putin's returning to the Kremlin when Balotna Balotna movement. Um, comes to, to life when tens of thousands take to the streets and TV Rain, as I just said, starts covering, covering the, uh, these protests. And uh, Putin's return is marked by, by unprecedented crackdown, Not something we never, we never, saw, we never saw before. Um, he crushed, crushes the Balotna movement very, 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 very soon, by in, in, in few months. Uh, many those who took to the streets, well, not many, but let's say 30, uh, around 30, uh, are arrested and get real, uh, real um, jail times. Uh, and uh, also new legislation is introduced, the legislation that we are now very well aware about. The, the idea of a foreign labeling entity as a foreign agent it uh, tracks back to 2012, 2013, when first NGOs in Russia were labeled as foreign agent, also as foreign agents. Also, um, taking to the streets, you uh, unsanctioned rallies are now punished with uh, huge fines, and it becomes really dangerous and expensive and uncomfortable to take to the streets. Why Putin is doing that? Um, because his, ra his, his approval rating. Uh, drops significantly uh, when he announces that he um, that he get, will get back to the Kremlin. The nation doesn't like it. Uh, Russians want uh, Medvedev to basically keep keep the power, and it's very visible. And that that shocks Putin. That the, the Balotny movement shocks him. He uh, and he he tries to respond. He responds with major 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 crackdown. Um, it doesn't really help. This, uh, this soaring approval rating in 2014, this is annexation of Crimea. It's not the crackdown which helps him, but the annexation of Crimea in 2014. And this is what, when the story of TV Rain is really very, uh, can show us what, what was going on. The TV, TV Rain was launched in 2010. Medvedev personally authorized it as, as president because he, wa he wanted to be different from, from Putin. He wanted to, to, you can't believe it now, I understand, but he wanted to look liberal. That's how it is when you want, when you start your own agenda. That's why change of power is so important. No matter what you are, you want to be different from your, from your predecessor. That's how it, how it works. And he, that's what was true about, about Medvedev. Then, um, then, TV Rain becomes really popular during uh, Balotna, basically the main news um, channel where you can get information about what was, what's going on about this protest, who takes to the streets. You turn on TV Rain and you watch. That's how uh, it became a prominent television channel in Russian cable because, because that was Medvedev's decision to let uh, TV Rain operate in 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 Russian in Russian cables, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the the uh, average daily outreach grows to one million viewers in 2012 when Putin comes back to power. I'll tell you a story, my uh, which I personally witnessed in 2012, spring 2012, uh, um, at a city of Astrakhan at south of, uh, of in the south of Russia, where. After Putin is already re-elected as, as president, but there they have a mayor. Uh, they elect a mayor, and the election is heavily rigged. And the opposition uh, candidate, who uh, supposedly won this election, but uh, um, but the election was rigged, so he was declared uh, uh, as as he as he lost it. He comes on a hunger strike, and uh, people stand behind him. He, they, they they support support him, and. Uh, I personally was there looking at how people took to the streets. 
doing stories for for TV Rain, which uh, with which I was I was back then, and I remember very well. I was uh, talking to uh, to a law enforcement officer who basically was in charge of of cracking down the the street protest in in in, in Astrakhan back back then, and he told me, "Oh, you're from TV Rain. We watch it, the whole unit, po uh, the police," and I was like, "Wow." Oh, so you are also watching it. Oh, so then things will start changing soon. Because you now, you, oh, that's, I couldn't believe it, but that was true. That's what he told me. Well, things started changing very fast indeed. Uh, because what matters, if you remember, is outreach. What uh, TV Rain became a really uh, national sort of uh, source, source of information. So uh, when, Second Maidan happens in Ukraine, and uh, which turns into a real revolution, basically, in January 2000, 2014. In February 2014, that's when we'll first learn, uh, for the first time, wars come together with censorship. They are unseparated. They all always go together. That's when, um, that's when TV Rain loses its access to cables. Um, that's when not only TV Rain, by the, by the way, also uh, the crackdown is, uh, is it's a major crackdown. TV Rain is part of it uh, because Putin is losing his fight in, in Kiev at, at this moment. He responds with cracking down on media. That's what happens. Uh, and um, that's when private cable television providers cut TV Rain from, uh, from, from their cables under, pretext, under the pretext that, uh, that one of the polls that TV Rain um, made back then, um, on-screen poll about the cost of not surrendering St. Petersburg during, to the Nazis during the, the blockade of uh, World, World War II, was it the was it, uh, right thing to do or, or not? That was the pretext that the Kremlin used to shut down TV Rain. TV Rain was shut down from cables, lost its office in the center, in the center of Moscow, was um, pulled, pulled out. Uh, I remember it very well, uh, that TV Rain was operating from a private apartment in, in Russia for a few months in 2014. I was part of it. It was basically just an apartment. Like in, I don't know, I, uh, when in Soviet times, um, Russian independent artists made uh, um, exhibitions in their, in, the, in their apartments. That basically looked very, very similar, but that was that how it was. It was cut from financial, from financial resources. So we had to switch to subscription financial, financial mod, mo, model almost immediately. That meant then that basically Kremlin uh, was uh, very went very well with the Kremlin because basically we cut our viewers from 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 watching TV Rain. What happened next was in 2019 when uh, when the decision uh, was made to to go to YouTube, and that's when the real new life started for for, for TV Rain. That's when these millions of millions of viewers came back, uh, and that's when. Uh, that's when I don't know, people started recognizing me on the streets, <laughs> because 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 everybody every everyone started watching TV TV Rain again and it became very very popular, uh, but and financially efficient also important to to understand because because YouTube generates um, traffic and generates uh, mm, profit. Uh, and uh, TV Rain at this, at this time becomes one of the cornerstones of this, uh, um, in this tightening world of, uh, of uh, Russian authority, author, author, um, uh, autocracy. Um, TV Rain together with Echo Moscovy, to, together with Nova Gazeta and not, not, not much else. Also uh, local um, investigative um, um, journalist, journalism projects, also very, very important ones. So that's where we are in, 2000, in 2019. TV Rain operates as, um, as, as, as a just television. It brings news to, uh, to Russian, like real, real news, not, not what you hear on, on major television channels. And uh, 
the investigative um, small packed uh, investigative projects, journalistic projects, become very uh, successful in, in what they do, in exposing corruption and theft. And uh, when I mentioned the major, um, the major free, uh, free um, media outlets before, I forgot to, to name one very important, Alexei Navalny. Because when he comes to the scene in late uh, 2000s, 2009, 2010, he comes, uh, his political platform as a, as a political leader is we expose corruption. And that's what he does very successfully. That's, uh, um, he starts his uh, anti-corruption foundation, which starts exposing theft and corruption in state, in state corporations. And he is more efficient than so many uh, newspapers out there. That's also because he doesn't have this uh, um, self-censorship grip upon him. That's his platform. No, we, we do not practice self-censorship. We do not do it. We, do, we go straight ahead. That's our belief. We want truth. We want uh, bring to justice those who, those who, those who steal. And uh, that's how he makes his, uh, his, his name. And it's, it's a journalistic work, basically. basically. And it still is. I mean, uh, until he, um, he was arrested. Yeah, he, he, uh, he was arrested a few days after he released the, vi the video of, on, on Putin's palace and, and uh, corruption around Putin's palace, which is the most viewed, uh, viewed political video in, in Russia. Uh, since then, 100 million views, more than that. So that's our reality by 2019, and Navalny is, Navalny is part of it. But things start changing in 2020 first, when, when Putin amends and changes the constitution, and literally, officially, Russia turns into a dictatorship. It doesn't even, officially on paper, doesn't have this, these checks and balances anymore. Um, uh, in 2020. Uh, also, at the same time, Navalny is poisoned with, uh, with Novichok in August 2020, and that means that uh, these are some new rules of the game. This di it didn't happen before. Yes, Russian government was uh, corrupt, cruel, brutal, but it didn't intend just to kill its op uh, political opponents. It, uh, the rules of the game suggested that no, they would be discredited, intimidated, um, but not murdered. Mm. And, and uh, well, uh, there is a, I wrote a book on Boris Nemtsov, and uh, he was murdered in, 2000, in 2015. I, uh, I still believe that, uh, that it was, well, uh, Putin accepted it, but he was not behind it. Uh, he, he didn't order it. Um, with Navalny, that was clear that it came in 2000, uh, 2020, that it came from, uh, directly from, from the Kremlin. It's a basically a proven fact, proven again by him, <laughs> personally. If you saw the movie, you probably saw the film, or you, you, know, you, 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 you know it. So, it, so it, why? What's going on? Why the rules of the game? are changing. Um, in 2021, is, 2021 is marked by unprecedented crackdown on uh, basically every, every living uh, space of uh, independence and, and freedom, including media. Um, but not only. Uh, Navalny is in jail. Uh, his, uh, his team is labeled as extremists. They have to flee. Uh, Russia uh, in 2021. Those who are not, they they get they get arrested um, uh, very 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 soon. Um, in end of April, um, Medusa, which I started my uh, my my sto story with, uh, the media outlet which was operating from Latvia al already, is labeled as a foreign agent. The label introduced in 2000 in 2000. It's and it's April. Uh, v Times, which, uh, which came to the, uh, the it was the second one in May, 
uh, V-Times, which uh, replaced Vedomosti when Vedomosti had to change its own ownership, the, the usual story of, of, of that times. Uh, foreign agent, what is it? It's uh, basically you are uh, labeled a foreign agent. That means that you, uh, that you, that this, the government shows to the nation that you are enemy and you are operating in the interest of uh, whoever and uh, you have to admit it and to um, and whatever you do you have uh, have to put a disclaimer that I am a foreign agent that's what uh, that's 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 who I am and you also uh, you also become subject to some bureaucratic scrutiny okay uh, what also important is uh, is important that in summer 2021, 2021 journalists individually be become uh, labeled as foreign as foreign agents, um, not as entities, not as outlets, not as organizations, not as companies, but on an individual level, just names, just a specific person, a journalist is uh, labeled as an outcast, as an enemy of the state. That was the, even back then, in, to, in summer 2021, when we were prepared to do a lot of things already. We understood where things were going. We, it really, um, basically, re, the reality was quite clear. Even back then, it was uh, very hard to swallow, very hard to, uh, to perceive how it is even possible. Now it's basically not a not, not, not a big deal anymore. I was labeled for an for an agent a month ago. Uh, more, uh, more than five hundred on the list already. Who cares? But back then, <laughs> a year and a half, two, two, uh, less than two years ago, that was huge. And also uh, in summer two thousand twenty-one, uh, the investigative uh, investigative journalistic project. Project called called Project is uh, is labeled undesired organization, which Medusa was labeled a week ago, and now I will explain what it uh, what it what it means. It means that um, it's a different story from being a foreign agent. That means that basically, if you are part of a company which is uh, labeled as undesired organization, you are subject to to jail almost immediately. And if you and if you interact with it, if you're not part, not part of it, but just interact with it, um, distribute it, uh, the, the content, you're also uh, also subject to, pr to prosecution and uh, g can get to up to four, four years in jail. That means that if I post, uh, if I um, forward the link, po uh, if on my Facebook page or wherever I I, uh, I, I post the, st the story, I'm already uh, I can be prosecuted. That's what. What, what is it about being uh, an undesired under organization? And that first happened with, the, with media in summer 2021. We just, we just didn't understand what was going on. Why? Why is it all happening? Why so hu su such a huge crackdown on media, on, every, every, on, on, on life? What's going on? Nobody, uh, nobody really understood. Well, now we know it was preparation for war. Now we know, but back then it was really hard to understand because it didn't make many sense, much sense. Why? So, and then comes the war. Um, well, it's clear with the with the, with the start of the war that uh, that uh, uh, everything comes to its end. It's uh, clear rationally. It's clear, um, but it's still such a huge shock. To, uh, to, to see what, what, what's going on, even those who anticipated it, like I did, uh, still was hard to, uh, it, just when it happens, it, it really ruins uh, your world. So um, um, the crackdown came immediately in a few days, and it was clear that it would, uh, it would, it would happen. Uh, the second week of the war, Akumaskwi, Tivirain, those out there who were still out there, uh, were shut down. Mm, Nova Gazeta was uh, shut down a few weeks later. Um, second week of the, of the war, new legislation is introduced, uh, which um, by uh, to punishing punishing 
speaking about this war, speaking truth about uh, this war, bringing, bringing this war to, uh, to Russia with uh, years of jail, even calling this war a war uh, be, be, became a crime. And that's when it, it became clear that you, if you are true to, uh, to, to journalistic standards, you just can't operate from, uh, from Russia anymore. It's no longer possible. Basically, uh, 99 and 9.9% and 9 of Russian independent journalists who still were doing their jobs in, in Russia by February 2022 um, left in a in few months. Uh, to, in, in, in two months. So basically, Russian independent journalism since then, um, since then, operates from from exile. That's why we, <laughs> that's why we are here. Um, and there are also a few things that I think I have to say. Um, the first is that I think I speak about uh, from from uh, from from myself, but I but I'm positive that uh, what I what I what I say is shared by vast majority of uh, Russian journalists in exile that we feel our, um, we know what we do. We feel our responsibility to, uh, to bring this war uh, back to Russia. The YouTube is still, uh, still operates in Russia. Facebook is banned, Instagram is banned, YouTube is still, is, is still, still operates. So TV Rain operates through, through YouTube and through YouTube my mission is to bring uh, truth about this war to Russia because Russia lives in this in in this propaganda uh, bab bubble and that's the the understanding of uh, this mission really uh, helps going um, um, helps uh, moving ahead helps uh, keeping uh, alive I would say helps uh, understanding uh, that we uh, we are still uh, at the right time, at the right place, we can do our jobs. We can do what we have to do, and that's my. The, if this is what I can do to um, to bring uh, this war to a uh, um, uh, sooner end, that's what I have to do. And again, I, I I'm totally positive that everyone, mostly everyone, shares this uh, this understanding. And the next thing is what I what I what I started with. Medusa was labeled undesired organization one week ago. That means that the fight continues. That means the war goes on and the, the, uh, the, the more cruel it becomes, the more brutal it becomes, the more people die, the more uh, the Kremlin would uh, fight uh, independent media still operating from, from, from exile. That's what will happen. Who undesired organization is it's a precedent because, because it's not an, a tiny uh, investigative pro project. It's a big media outlet source for of information for ten hundreds of thousands of uh, of uh, those who speak russian and and read russian now labeled as undesired organization i told you about the implications of that who is next so this fight continues that means life continues and we keep fighting thank you very much